All right, well, church, it was, uh, it was in eighth grade that I discovered that I actually had a, a love and a passion for, for history. It was the first chance that I had to study world history. And so I absolutely fell in love with it, especially I love the ancient history. And that's something that I continued to study through high school and continued to study through, through college and my degrees that I got. Um, I loved the chance to study, study history, and it all started there in that eighth grade world history class. Ironically, it was also in that class that I got my worst grade ever in school. I did the worst in that class than any other class I ever took in school. And, and the reason wasn't necessarily the, the subject matter, but it was a, it was a, a problem with, with me. It was a problem with something in, in my life. And, you know, Connor spoke a little while ago about how we each have our own kinds of things that, that are sometimes temptations for us and struggles for us that we need to lay at the altar of God. Well, when I was younger, and it's still a temptation now in my life, but, but my struggle was, was arrogance. I was extremely arrogant. And I know some of you are thinking, I don't know if I believe that or not. Talk to my wife. I really struggled with that when I was, when I was younger. And when I was in the eighth grade, man, I thought I knew everything already. Even though I was like falling in love with the subject of, of, of history, um, our, our teacher in that class assigned a project for us that we had to write a two-page paper on any subject that we had studied during the course of that semester. And I hadn't really written many papers before, but I thought papers were pretty useless. And so when our teacher gave us that assignment, and he gave us the whole semester to do it, I thought, I'm going to show him I am not going to do it. I absolutely refuse to do that assignment. And uh, it turns out that he showed me. Uh, when, the, when the progress reports came out at the, the halfway through and I had not done any work on it, no rough draft, nothing like that, uh, I, I got it, took home a progress report that said F in that class. And uh, as someone who had been, you know, A's and B's all throughout school, um, my parents weren't very happy with that progress report. And they, they were very pointed in their uh, disapproval of my performance in that class. So... I was still very mad at the teacher. I was very mad at the assignment. I was not going to give in, but I had to get through the class. So I just put down a bunch of junk on a page of paper and turned it in. I put zero effort into that project whatsoever. And the teacher was very generous by giving me a C in that class. Um, it, and I, I don't know why I did that. It was just, you know, the arrogance of, of youth, I guess. Uh, but I did learn a couple lessons through that. It took me a little while to realize it, but not only did I learn that I loved history, but I also learned a principle in that class that if you put very little effort into something, you're going to get very little out of it as a result. I put very little effort into that project, and I got a low grade as a result of it, something that I remember all these years later, more than I care to count, because remember, I love history, not math. Um, but if you, put little, if you put a little effort into something, you don't get much out of it. And uh, there's actually a principle in the Bible that speaks about that. Over and over again, you see in scriptures this idea that if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. That's a principle that goes all throughout Scripture. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus teaches about it. The apostles teach about it. The prophets speak about it over and over again. If you put just a little effort into something, you're not going to get much out of it. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. That is a principle of our faith. You see, if we are stingy in our faith, if we are selfish and self-centered, we are not going to get a lot out of our faith. We're not going to make much progress in it. We're not going to have much strength in it. We're not going to have much joy in our faith. We're not going to have assurance when we go through hard times that God is with us if we're not putting effort into our faith. Because you know what? We serve a God that is generous and calls us to be like him. And if we're not doing that, if, then we're not like him. And we're not going to get the benefit of being like him. Remember, the goal of the Christian faith is not just 
to cross the finish line and to get into heaven. That's not the goal that we have for us. It's not just that we are, are trying to make sure that we stay out of hell for all of eternity. We just want to get to those pearly gates. The goal of our Christian faith is that you and I would become more like Jesus. That's why we're Christians. We want to be like our master. We want to be like Jesus. We want to develop those characteristics. We want to treat people the way he treats people, see people the way he sees people, love people the way that he loves people. Be the kind of person that he calls us to be, that, that resembles him, so that when people look at us, they see Jesus' love through us. That's the goal. We need to be more like the God that we serve. And we need to remember that our God is giving. He is generous, even to the point of sacrifice. That's the model that he sets for us, that he was the God who loved us so much that he didn't condemn us, but he sent his son Jesus into this world to pay our penalty for our sin, sacrifice himself in our place to give us eternal life. That's the kind of God that we serve, that we are called to be like. So I can already tell what some of you are thinking. Oh, no. The preacher is going to be talking about giving this morning. It is October after all, right? That is stewardship time of the year. I can see it kind of in some of your faces, although it's kind of hard to see up here sometimes. It is a little bit about giving. It is a little bit about finances. But I got to tell you that, that when the Bible talks about generosity, it is so much more than just about our pocketbooks. It's about the effort that we put into our faith. It's about the, the effort that we put into our relationships with one another. It is about the, the way in which we, we love each other in Christ's family. It's about the way that we use our time, how we serve him. There's so much more than just our, our finances. In fact, generosity is a, a way of life. It is a way of acting. It is a way of being. It's not just cutting a check or anything like that. It is a whole way of, of acting. And so this month as we're talking about spiritual, uh, spiritual habits, things that we can do to grow in our faith, to become more and more of a person that resembles Jesus, I'm going to talk to you this morning about generosity because our God is generous. There is a spiritual habit of generosity, just as we are called to pray all the time. Just as we are called to study God's word daily, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, we are called to be generous as well, as a way of life, as a regular habit that we choose each day and then work on each day and grow in so that we become more and more like Jesus. It's a spiritual habit for us, at least if we're doing it right, it's a spiritual habit for us. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want to share with you from, from Scripture this morning uh, a passage that deals with this topic of generosity. Uh, what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus, to be generous like God is generous. And I want to share with you a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, after I share this passage with you, I want to kind of dig into the situation in which Paul is writing this a little bit. Uh, because this is probably not a very familiar passage for, for most people in the church, uh, whether it's this church or just about any other church that's out there. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it's verses 6 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord for us this morning. He says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. Makes sense, right? Even if you have a great year, even if you have a bumper crop, if you only plant one row of seeds, just a little bit of seeds, you're not going to get much out of it. So if you only plant a few seeds, you only get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. In other words, don't give because you feel it's a a duty, or you have to, or you ought to, or people are going to think less of you if you don't. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. You've probably heard those words, right? God loves a cheerful giver. That's where it comes from. 
right here. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. That, by the way, is a quote from Psalm 112. If you've never read Psalm 112, it's a psalm that's all about righteousness. The people who, who are righteous, who live out their faith correctly with God. And it ties righteousness directly into generosity in that psalm. So continuing on verse 10, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we, and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. For two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And, then, and, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. Did you catch that last verse? Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. You know what the gift that he's talking about is? The gift that is too wonderful for words is the opportunity to give, the opportunity to be generous. Thank God for the gift of being generous. It's too good, uh, too good of a gift to even describe in words. There's so much benefit to it, Paul is saying. This is a really interesting passage, and I've got to tell you that in all the years I've been preaching, going back to 1990. Six? No, 1998. 99. 1999. Yeah, 1999. Um, and again, that's more years. Like I said, history is my subject, not math. It's more years than I want to do in my head. Uh, but going back to 1999, I've been preaching, and I don't think I've ever used this passage in a sermon before. I've, I've taught out of it a couple times, but I've never really used it on a Sunday morning uh, kind of message. And, and so it's, it's a passage that, I was kind of drawn to this week because of this topic of generosity, but I had to do some, some research and digging into it to understand what's happening here a little bit. Uh, the Apostle Paul is in the middle of what we refer to as his third missionary journey. He is going from the region around Antioch back through Turkey, and he is going through the churches that he helped to establish and found in Greece with the intention that this trip is going to wrap up with him back in the city of Jerusalem. And the reason why he's going back to Jerusalem is because the mother church there in Jerusalem that all these other churches sprang from it is struggling right now during this time. They're really struggling. Paul wants to go back and strengthen the churches that he founded in Greece, and he wants to collect an offering to take to the church in Jerusalem. Because none of these people would have had the faith if the disciples in Jerusalem and the first Christians hadn't maintained it and fought for it and taught it and shared it and, and, and the, you know, seen the, the Holy Spirit take this faith all throughout the Roman Empire. It all came from Jerusalem. So they, wanna, they want to take this offering back to meet the needs of the Jerusalem church. They're going through persecution in Jerusalem. Uh, there are people who are being arrested, who are suffering, who are dying for their faith. And on top of the persecution in the city of Jerusalem, there is also famine. They're dealing with a, a shortage of, of food. And, uh, you know, in our modern society of supply chains and things like that, that's a little hard for us to understand, although you may have gotten a glimpse for it if you were looking for baby formula earlier this year. Um, you know, there was, no, there was no supply chain to bring extra food into Jerusalem. It was the backwater of the empire. The Romans didn't care if they starved or not. That'd be one less group to revolt against them. So the Christians there, the, the early Christians were struggling. And so Paul wants to take an offering from the churches in Greece back to the city of Jerusalem. Now you have to realize that when Paul is talking about giving and generosity, when he's talking about the idea of collecting this offering, the people that he's talking to in the churches in Greece, in the city of Corinth here in this passage, they're not rich people, 
okay? Most first century Christians were surviving day to day. They were struggling to get by. They were poor. The Christian movement started basically among the social outcasts. It wasn't the wealthy, it wasn't the well-to-do that were attracted to the gospel. It was the people that had no hope. People who were struggling. The poorest of the poor. People who were sick and outcast from society. Those were the ones who were coming to Christ because for the first time in their life, they found people that loved them, that cared for them, that helped them. For the first time in their life, they had something that they could believe in, something that would give them hope, a chance to, to see restitution in eternity, that, that, that everything that they had suffered would be worth it. There was, there was a hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ they found nowhere else. And so they became Christians. And unfortunately for most of them, once they became Christians, they actually suffered even more for their faith. They lost their jobs. Some of them had their houses confiscated. Everything they owned taken away from them. They were thrown in prison. They were physically beaten and abused, suffering lifelong injuries for being a follower of Christ and sometimes even dying for him. So these were people who were, were struggling. And then Paul calls them to take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And in fact, if you look earlier in this passage, in this chapter, he even re reminds them that the idea of the offering wasn't actually Paul's. It was their idea. They wanted to do it when they heard that the people in Jerusalem were suffering. And Paul is just making it happen for them. These aren't people who are giving out of their, their surplus because they have extra. They're giving what they need to survive because they know that if they don't, their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem are literally dying without it. And so Paul calls them to give and to give generously. Give knowing that it is worth it in the end. It reminds me a little bit about the, the mission trip that I took to Jamaica when I was in college over spring break. And yes, it was a mission trip. It was a mission trip. We, we were at the end of the road, down the river on a boat, out in the jungle, building a, a house for a, a pastor to come and move to this village. Every day that we were there, we ate some of the best food I have ever had in my life. The freshest fruit wonderful uh, chicken and rice and just just amazing food and as we were a couple days into building this i noticed that as we were eating the people of the village weren't eating with us which i thought was odd because this would be a great time to celebrate together and eat together and feast together as we did all this great work and finally i asked one of the village leaders about why they weren't eating with us was it something that we had done had we offended them in some way and um he shared with me that the food that we were eating was all the food that they had there wasn't anything left for them they weren't rich people they were they were poor they were struggling to get a pastor to come and you know so we were trying to help them out but they were they were giving they were sacrificing to give and they were so so incredibly generous to us that's the kind of thing that's happening here in this passage paul is calling these these christians who are dirt poor themselves to be generous, to give to others because it's going to be worth it in the end. And you know what? They were convinced of it. They believed it. They lived it out. They saw that it was worth it. They were generous. They were willing to give sacrificially. And that's what, that's what giving is. It is making a sacrifice. This is something that, that we struggle with so much in our, in, in our modern world because we have everything we want and then some. I mean, we are in the middle of the throwaway culture, right? We have everything we could ever want and then some. And if we don't have it, we can get it pretty easily without too much effort. We don't even understand what it is to give. Because we, we do everything that we want to. We buy everything we want to. We have everything we want to. We do whatever we want to. We give our time and our effort into every cause that we want to. And then whatever we have left over, we think about giving when we've satisfied ourselves. That is completely foreign to the scriptures. That way of thinking is completely opposite of what the scriptures say. Giving is a sacrifice. And that's something that we need to understand, something that we need to, to come back with, because I don't really know if we believe that any longer today or not. Even though we have so much, so much more than we need, 
we still have really kind of a, a scarcity mindset that we just never feel like we have enough. We always want more. We don't know if we can, can trust that if we give, there's going to be enough for us. We don't know that if we, if we give, are we going to have enough hours in the day? Are we going to have enough time, enough effort to be able to take care of ourselves if we give to God's kingdom? I'm going to be so tired if I go and support this at the church or to do this kind of ministry event. I just don't know if I can, can you know, get enough rest and me time before having to get back to the grind. I don't know if I, if I give that kind of offering they talk about in church for a, a tithe or, or whatever special project's going on, the disaffiliation, the new building that we want to do across the street. I don't know if I, get, if I give that, if I'm really going to have enough left to do what I want to do. It's a scarcity kind of thinking. It actually reminds me of um, you know, our, our grandparents or, or some of your parents or great-grandparents that lived during the Depression era. They, they developed a scarcity mindset. These were the people, remember, that, that later on in life, because they had gone to the banks and their money was gone, they didn't trust the banks any longer, so they, they stuffed their mattresses with their cash or they hid it in the floorboards or all these different kinds of things. You've, you've heard stories about that, right? Because they didn't trust that it would be there when they needed it if they didn't take care of it themselves. We still have that mindset, even though we have everything that we want, we want to take care of it ourselves. We want to take care of ourselves and provide for ourselves because we just don't know if we can trust God take care of us and in fact we don't even know if we want to get into a situation where we have to test him to see if he's going to take care of us we've got everything we want we'll take care of ourselves thank you very much God and if anything's left over of our time and our effort our finances we'll give that that's the kind of way that we think and it's completely different than what you see in the scriptures Paul says to give sacrificially because it's worth it. Because we realize that in the end, the sacrifice is not only covered by God, but it is of benefit to our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's benefit to his work. We have the idea that we want everything in our faith with zero risk. It's exactly the opposite. We don't get anything in our faith until we're willing to risk we're willing to trust because that's what faith is faith is the ability to trust in what we do not see to believe in what we cannot feel and see right in front of us you know paul tells us to be generous because in the end it is it is worth it and he actually lays out in this passage four benefits that i want to go through real quickly for you for um, for being generous, for giving sacrificially. And I know you're thinking, four, man, we're going to be here till 1 o'clock. You know? Just real quickly, I want to go through these four benefits uh, with you. There are four benefits for, for, for being generous. First of all, he tells us in this passage that when we are generous with our time, our effort, our resources, our, our love and support for one another, the way that we build into the lives of other people around us, that's a way of being generous, right? When we are generous, he tells us, first of all, we become more like Jesus because our God is generous, right? We are following Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but rather humbled himself and laid down his life on the cross for us, sacrificing himself for us, not because we're worthy, not because we earned it, not because he got a great benefit out of it, but because he loved us and was willing to, to sacrifice because he's generous so when we are generous we become more like him you know all those spiritual habits that we've been talking about the prayer the scripture the others that we're going to be talking about as we go through this rest of this month they are all great for us to to grow in our faith and to become more like jesus but i'll tell you what this spiritual habit of generosity more than just about any others really helps us to become more like him because in generosity, we are getting right to the heart of who God is. And we are breaking our greatest sin and temptation in our life of serving ourselves. Generosity, you have to get beyond serving yourself to think about others. And that's the nature of God. 
thinking about others. So we become more like God. We become more like Jesus. Even more than we do just with prayer or, or study of Scripture. When, we, when we're generous, we become more like, like Jesus, the way that he acted. The second benefit for it is Paul tells us that when we are generous, God provides for us. Now, it's not just when we're giving our extra. Because some of us have been thinking, you know, hey, I've, I've given to God over the years. I've given what was left over to him, and I haven't really seen God move in powerful ways. Yeah, you're right. I bet you haven't. But when we are generous, when we give sacrificially, that's when we give God the opportunity to show up and show off. That's when he provides. You have to kind of go out on the limb a little bit to really learn that he's faithful. Paul promises us here, and in fact, Scripture promises us over and over again that when we are, are generous, when we go out on that limb, when we trust him, he's going to provide. He even tells us back in the book of, of Malachi to test him. Everyone thinks, no, I don't want to test God. Do not test the Lord your God, right? No, this one you can. Test him. Try him. Try him. Give your offerings to him. Be generous as he is generous, and he is going to provide. He takes care of it. You may not have everything you possibly could want, because remember, that's just serving ourselves anyway, but he provides everything that you need. That's the kind of God he is. There's a benefit to that. That, that learning that God provides for us, because then we have more trust. We have more faith. We start hearing his voice guiding us and leading us and know, hey, he's not going to drop me. He's not going to let me down, because he's proven it over and over again. As I give to him, he takes care. That's how we grow in our faith. Learn that God provides for us. The third benefit, the third benefit that he outlines here in this passage is that people's needs are met. This is kind of where we usually start thinking about the benefits of giving. Here it's further down on Paul's list. He says, you know, the, the needs of the church in Jerusalem are going to be met. And, that, and that's a great goal. That's a great thing to keep in mind, that, that thankfully we have the opportunity to meet the needs of other people. We have an opportunity to impact their lives. Uh, that is a, a privilege and a blessing for us to be able to do. The fact that, that someone's life is going to be affected because of us. I mean, we all want something to live beyond us, right? We all want some kind of a legacy that we're going to be remembered for. Paul says this is, this is it. Being generous means that, that you will have a legacy that goes beyond you. People will remember that. You'll help to meet their needs. And then the fourth benefit ties right into that. It says not only will you have the opportunity to meet their needs, but you are going to provide people an opportunity to trust and praise God. So if you want a legacy that goes about beyond you, how about a legacy that lasts for eternity? A legacy of your giving to another person that will give them the opportunity to praise and thank God, to trust God in their life because they saw his love tangibly through you. You can affect them for all of eternity. You could be the one person that proves to them that God loves them. They may be wondering, they may be questioning in their life, does God even know what's happening to me? Does he care about what's happening to me? Does he love me? And it is through your building into their life, through you giving your time, through you giving your effort, through you giving your resources, that they, that they see tangibly that God does know them and loves them. You know what kind of an impact that makes in their life, in their eternity? Man, your legacy can last forever. We're generous like God is generous. So I want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you to be generous as our God is generous. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your, your effort that you put into your faith. Be generous in your love and your care for one another. And the way you touch their lives, people's lives for eternity. Be generous in giving your resources. If we only put a little effort into our faith, we're only ever going to get a little out of it. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow generously, reap generously.
If we only give of ourselves grudgingly and sparingly, we are only ever going to have a weak faith. So, like I said, my challenge for you this week, in addition to praying the prayers and promises of Scripture, which was the announcement I forgot earlier this morning, it's on the bulletin insert in your, your bulletin. There's a guide for you to, to do that, to pray every day the promises that God gives us in Scripture. Uh, in addition to that, and in addition to reading God's Word, spending time every day studying His Word, I want to challenge you to be generous, as God has been generous to you. Because that's going to give you opportunities to share the love of Jesus. And it's ge- if it's generous in giving to the church, great, we've got some great things going on here. We would love to have you do that. If it's generous in giving to another cause that's out there where you're serving the needs of people, go for it. If it's generous in giving your time and your effort to people who, who need a friend in their life, who need someone to, to mentor them, to build them, do it. Because every time we do that, it makes us more like Jesus. And we learn how to share his love better with his people. So be generous. Let's pray together. Father, we know that in our world, we so often struggle with selfishness. It is our greatest temptation, our greatest sin in our life. And it manifests in so many different ways in our life. But Lord, ultimately, whether it's in addictions, whether it's in wasting the things that you've given us, whether it's in hurting people around us, Lord, ultimately the cause of it is our selfishness, serving ourselves, not being generous as you are generous, sacrificial as you are sacrificial, giving as you are giving. It is looking out for ourselves rather than than you and others. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to be more generous. Lord, we want people to, to look at us here at Bon Air Church, Lord, and see people who are generous. We want people to think that, that no, that, that's not a, a cliquish church. That's not a selfish church. That's not a, a church that cares only for themselves. That's a generous church. That is people who show the love of God through their actions through the things that they do, through the way that they treat people. We want to be like you, that when people look at us, they see you. So, Father, we pray that you'd help us to to grow in our faith, to choose to be more like you, and to consistently choose day after day to grow in these spiritual habits that we need to be the people that you've called us to be, people who resemble you. Lord, help us to be people of prayer. Help us to be people of your word, who not only study your word, but live by your word. Do the things that you tell us to do. And Lord, help us to be people who are generous, as you are generous. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.